nothing, no drug can ever equate to that experience. Like there's nothing out there. It's just your mind is just, well, for me, it, it was just gone. On June 12, 2005, 21-year-old Ashley Parlier of Battle Creek, Michigan, had a fight with her parents and left the house. She was never seen again, and everyone, including her family and friends, was suspicious for years. It took 18 years for the police and the Parlier family to get the answers they had been looking for all along. Hi, and welcome back to Mysterious Case 7. If you are new here, please consider subscribing, as it helps us motivate to create more intriguing content for you. Let's have a look at the 18-year-old cold case finally solved in 2023, Ashley Parlier's case. Let's get right into the story without further ado. Battle Creek is a small city in the southwest of Michigan. It has nice neighborhoods and friendly communities, as well as a booming industry and a lot of chances for its people to grow. Battle Creek is known as the place where the cereal industry started. It is located between two states and a major highway which brings a steady flow of people to see its beautiful scenery. Downtown Battle Creek is a busy place that feels very much like a neighborhood. Battle Creek is one of the best places in Michigan to raise a family because of how beautiful it is and how many things there are to do. In 2005, a 21-year-old man went missing without a sign from the same thriving and friendly town. Russell and Sherry Parlier had their second child, a girl, on October 16, 1983. They named her Ashley. Ashley has always been shy and quiet, even when she was a child. She was also very young and innocent which made it hard for her to make friends as she got older. Nicole Campan, Ashley's older sister, said that her sister was very honest. She said that one of the things she remembered most about her was how honest she was and how she always saw the best in people. She wanted people to be the way she thought the world should be, which a good thing was. Ashley had gorgeous brown eyes and brown hair, and her smile, even though her teeth were crooked, was very pretty. Ashley also had a slight mental disability that made her act like a teen between 12 and 14 years old. Even though she had problems, she managed to enjoy life. She finished high school at Battle Creek Central and got a job at the Taco Bell in the 800 block of Northeast Capitol Avenue, which was the closest one. She worked at Taco Bell and saved some of the money she made there so she could buy her own car. But disaster was just around the corner for Ashley, a young woman who just wanted the world to be a happy place. Even though she was kind and gentle, the world wasn't nice to her. Ashley Parlier, who was 21 years old, stood about 5 feet 9 inches tall and only weighed 100 pounds. So, when her parents saw what looked like a bump on her on June 12, 2005, they were very worried. Ashley was just too innocent, both by nature and by the way she thought. They were worried about her health, so if she chose to carry the baby, they wanted her to see a doctor and get prenatal care. Ashley and her parents had a big fight about the whole thing, so she left the house. She didn't have a car, a driver's license, a cell phone, or a credit card. She did, however, hout $700 in cash on her. The family thought she needed some time to calm down, but Ashley never came back home. When minutes turned into hours and then into days, 
The Paulia family started to worry because they knew something was wrong. At first, they thought Ashley would spend a few days at the home of one of her friends to calm down and then come home to them. But when she hadn't come back after several days and they couldn't reach her, they had no choice but to call the police and report her missing. There wasn't much evidence or tips for the police to follow. So, they showed the public a picture of Ashley Paulia and wrote down what she looked like in the hopes that this would help them find some leads. Along with her height, weight, and body type, they also talked about what she was wearing when she went missing. Last seen, she was wearing a checkered shirt, blue jeans, and brown leather shoes. Not long after, the cops heard from many people that they had seen him, especially around Hooten Lake. The family took a deep breath of relief. They wanted to find her so they could convince Ashley to come back home. But soon after, the cops told the Parlia family something bad. All the sightings were false and can't be proven. So wherever Ashley was, she wasn't ready to go back home yet. When the investigation hit stage two, Sherry and Russell, Ashley's parents, were the only ones who had filed a complaint. It took them a while to do so, though. Her dad decided to take a polygraph test and was found to be innocent. But Ashley's mother, Sherry, said she didn't want to take the test. Sherry had already started to show signs of Huntington's disease, which was correctly identified a few years later. Nicole, Ashley's sister, made it clear that Ashley had never done anything like not coming home for this long. She said that Ashley had never done anything like that before, but her family thought she went to a friend's house to blow off steam because she and her husband had a big fight before she left. But Ashley's family and the police thought she was pregnant with his kid. At the time of the questioning, he had another pregnant lover. He wasn't thrown out as a suspect, but the police couldn't find any proof that he did it. Ashley's close friends and family members were also questioned, but no new information was found. But something else came up. The police found out that Ashley might have wanted to kill herself. If she had killed herself, the cops thought, they would be able to find her body somewhere. So, the cops looked for her body hard. There was nothing of value to be found. Then they thought that Ashley might have been robbed, but her social security number hadn't changed while she was gone. The cops were ready to tell the Paulia family more bad news at this point. They told her family that they thought Ashley had been killed by someone else, and that it was likely that she was already dead. They also told her family that they would keep trying to help her. They kept looking for Ashley Paulia for a long time, but the case went cold in the end. Several officers from the Battle Creek Police Department worked on Ashley's case over the next 18 years. The whole department was puzzled by her disappearance because they kept finding persons of interest, but there was never enough proof against any of them to make them suspects. When people thought she might have been killed outside of Battle Creek City in the year 2020, they gave the case to the Sheriff's Department. They had to break through in the case only in 2021, when they were least expecting it. After about 16 years of doing nothing, the case had gone cold. Then something happened that made everything different. When Pennsylvania police found an unexpected lead in the case of Ashley Parlia, they got in touch with Calhoun police. In January 2021, Police in Pennsylvania questioned Harold David Hallman, a 44-year-old serial killer, about the deaths of two different women, Tiana Phillips and Erica Schultz. Hallman asked the police at the time if they could combine the cases of Phillips, Schultz, 
and Parlia because he did not want to go to trial. During the talk, the police did not say anything about Ashley Parlia. They didn't even know what he was talking about. So, they asked him more questions about the Parlia case and were shocked by what they found. During their talks, the cops had never talked about Ashley Parlia. They didn't even know what he was talking about. So, they asked him more questions about the Parlia case and were shocked by what they found. It wasn't just a hint, it was an outright declaration. The agents called the Calhoun County Police Department right away to tell them about the new information in the case. When Calhoun County PD took over, their investigation showed that Harmon had stayed in Battle Creek from 2002 to 2009 and had talked to Parlia. After Ashley had the fight at home, the police found out that Harmon had been in touch with Parlia. She went to his home in Emmett Township, Michigan, to see him. Ashley told him that her parents wanted to take a test to see if she was pregnant. Later, Ashley and Harmon got into a fight, and Harmon beat her until she was asleep. He then took her to the Pennsylvania Hills and hit her head with a piece of wood until she could no longer move. He also told them that he had left Ashley somewhere in the northern part of Newton Township and gotten rid of his bloody clothes. On November 29, 1978, Harold David Heyman was born. Until he was a young adult, he lived with his father in Germany when his father moved to Turkey. Haman stayed behind to live with his girlfriend. He looked like a normal young man at the time. No one would have guessed that he would become a serial killer as an adult. He killed someone for the first time when he was 20 years old. The Air Force Colonel's 21-year-old son, Josef Whitehurst, was living on a military base in southwest Germany. He went missing on May 30, 1999, and was found a few days later outside Ramstein Air Base. He killed himself with a club that was found at the scene of the crime. When German police caught Heyman for a crime that had nothing to do with Whitehurst, he admitted to killing him when he started dancing around the campfire. Haman said that Whitehurst scared him, so he went after him first. Haman also told the cops that Whitehurst made him feel scared, so he attacked him first. Haman stated to the police that it had been the most thrilling experience he had ever had. He couldn't recall how many times he had hit him, but he mentioned that it felt like his entire body was involved. After that, he left the scene. Even though he admitted it, he was only sent to a German rehab school for six years. German law says that anyone under 21 must be tried in a court for young people. Haman had also been labeled with schizophrenia at the time which made his sentence lighter. He then moved back to America and worked as a truck driver. He lived near Battle Creek Lakeview and the Fairfax Edition in Ett Township. Around this time, he seemed to play a big part in Ashley Parlier's departure. In 2005, Tiana Phillips, a mother of two who went missing on June 13, 2018 didn't come back. When he was finally arrested three years later and questioned by police, he admitted that he hadn't wanted to kill Phillips in particular, but he did want to kill again. Erica Schultz wasn't sure if she should meet someone she talked to online. She called him Dave. Erica was reported missing on December 6, 2020. Erika had autism and liked to stick to her routines. So, when she didn't show up, the cops looked at her phone records and found that Haman was the one who killed her. When he was caught, he said in his confession 
that killing Erika Skoltz was just another day at the park for him. He was found with a self-inflicted wound on railway tracks in Duncan and Pennsylvania. He thought that because of his sins, he had to die. Haman said that he killed Schultz and Phillips while he was getting care in the hospital. When he was in jail, he wrote a message to his ex-wife in which he told her that he had killed Phillips, with whom he had been having an affair. He said he wanted to admit to the crime to show that he would never do something like that with her. It must have scared his ex-wife because she gave the letter to the cops. She also said that Harmon said he had killed a woman in the past, but she didn't believe him. He was a serial killer because all of his crimes had one thing in common. All of his victims were gone. They were all hurt in the head. He struck them first and knocked them out, then finished the job. He put the bodies in places far away, but he didn't bury them. Phillips and Skultz were actually both killed on the same spot. In the cases of Erica Schultz and Tayana Phillips, Haman has been charged with kidnapping, murder, and abuse of a body. John Pignatro of the Calhoun County Sheriff's Department said that Haman was transient in 2021 and didn't have a fixed address in Pennsylvania. He said that everything that went wrong was because of his family and his failed marriage. He believed that there were individuals who were considered alphas and those who were not. According to him, that was simply the way life was. He admitted to killing someone, using a log to strike them in the head. But he was unsure if that was the cause of death due to the darkness of the setting. At the time of the incident, they were sitting by a campfire. He revealed that he struck the person multiple times and believed in a dynamic where there was a master and a slave. This, he claimed, was how life functioned. He also suggested that the person he killed had engaged in extramarital affairs because he couldn't assert his dominance over his wife. Following the death of Harley Erd, Haman delved into studying serial killers, stating that it piqued his interest. He confessed that he didn't feel any drug could pair to the thrill he felt from murder, and it consumed his mind. When asked which murder stuck with him the most, he stated that he remembered all of them, including the specifics of how he had killed them. The authorities suspected him of being a serial killer, but he denied any involvement in additional murders, attributing his wife's accusations to her continuous involvement with the police. He insisted that he had no doubts about what he had done, who had to be removed from the streets right away. Haman himself said that he hadn't been caught. He would have killed someone else. Haman's statement made a point of saying that he met Ashley Parlier at her parents' place. The court paper confession also highlighted that he initiated a conversation with her, which led to deeper relations later. Ashley told him that her parents wanted her to get a pregnancy test. He came clean and said that he was the father of the baby Ashley was having. The next time they fought, he got so angry that he knocked her out. Then, on June 13, 2005, in the evening, he hit her several times on the head and killed her. He described the location where they were sitting as an overgrown field situated in the middle of nowhere in Michigan, approximately 10 miles away from the nearest town. He noted that there was a small structure in the vicinity, possibly a garage or a house, but it appeared to be unoccupied. They settled there and sat down. He confessed that he was in his own world, lost in thought as they sat. Ashley was in the back, right the door. He had made up his mind to kill her there. When he sat down with Ashley's limp body next to him, he realized he had found a good place. 
According to him, during the time he was there, no vehicles passed by the location. As he sat there, he contemplated the situation, and the more he thought about it, the more he believed that it was an ideal spot to carry out his plan. Eventually, the murder occurred. He lured the victim out of her house and led her to the designated spot where the deed was to be done. He admitted to striking her and then watched as she died. Once he was sure Ashley wasn't there anymore, he went home and showered. Later, he got rid of his clothes at his old job, an American super center called Maya, where he worked at the time. Even stranger is that he kept up with the case for years and years. At one point, he even went to check on Ashley's body, but all he found were bones. After being asked more questions, he came forward and said he was sorry to the Parlier family, home, and said they didn't plan it. He said that was not what he wanted for Ashley. He expressed that of all the murders he had committed. He felt the worst about Ashley's death. It's worth noting that statement was made in recent years after he had already taken the lives of several people. Nicole, Ashley's sister, was unable to contain her emotions when she discovered that Ashley had gone to Harmon's home, seeking help, only to be met with cold-blooded murder. She was baffled and devastated by the revelation. Despite this, she expressed that she did not have any hope that he would change because she believed that for him, it was more about power and control. She refused to let him have any more influence over their family and decided to focus on the memories of their sisters, including Ashley, Tiana, and Erica, who were good people that loved and cared for each other. She also acknowledged that it was challenging for their parents, who were grieving and experiencing a decline in their health due to Huntington's disease. Path, many of the people he killed had a family, had died without finding out what happened to their family. Nicole made a social media page called Bring Ashley Home, which helped her get in touch with the older sisters of the other Pennsylvania victims. They thought that their sadness brought them together and help them make friends. She said that Nicole will be joined by the older sisters of the other Pennsylvania victims when she makes her victim impact statement at Harman's trial on April 10 on behalf of the whole Parlia family. She said that we would think of our sisters, kind-hearted and sadly, that kind of toughness and integrity is what caused her death. So, that's how Tiana died. And that was how Ashley died. They just got along. They just wanted friends. And Ashley, Tiana, and Erica will be the ones we remember, not him. We'll remember that they were good people who loved and cared for each other. He's just going to waste away. Ashley had left her house 18 years ago because she had a fight with her parents. After what happened to her, she never went back to her home. The cops were sure they could get her back home. Over the years, they turned over every stone they could to find solutions. So when Harold Heyman told the cops what he had done, they asked him to show them where he had put Ashley's body. The people working for the prosecution thought that Ashley Parlia's case was a very emotional and hard-working one. It had been almost 20 years since the first detectives tried to find answers. In the years after that, more detectives tried to find answers. When they couldn't find the answers in the city, they gave the Parlia case to more than one agent. They even went all over the country to find possible witnesses and the proof they needed to catch the bad guy. 
Sheriff Steve Hinckley told the reporters and the public that the officers had gone to California, Maryland, and Pennsylvania to look in taste of Parlia. Detective John Pignatro of the Calhoun County Sheriff's Department, Detective Dave Hominga of the Calhoun County Sheriff's Department, and Detective Sergeant Chris Suarez of the Michigan State Police all worked on the case. Homing led the cops to a wooded area on a six and a half mile road in Newton Township, which is south of Battle Creek. On March 30, 2022, after searching for several hours, almost two dozen cops looked for Ashley's body. They couldn't find her body. People who lived in the area told the media that when Ashley went missing, the area was farmland. But within a few years, it was all split up and sold to different people. All of the cops' work was for nothing. Homing said that he couldn't remember where he had left Ashley after all these years and all the changes that had happened in the area. The cops are still looking for Ashley's body parts. Surprisingly, the man who had already killed three women and probably more was afraid of getting the death penalty. He got two sentences of life in jail. He was not given any kind of freedom. In February 2023, Homing admitted to killing Ashley Parlier in the second degree. He decided to help the Calhoun County Police find Ashley's body parts and the place where he is said to have thrown them away. As part of the deal with the Luzon County District Attorney's Office to avoid the death sentence, he has to do this. He could get up to another life in jail, and the judge will decide in April 2023. The Calhoun County Sheriff is still looking for any clues that could help solve the case of Ashley Parlier and find her body. Call the office of the Calhoun County Sheriff at 269-781-880 if you know something. When a loved one goes missing, every minute is hard. Imagine being hurt, sad, and angry for 18 years with only a tiny bit of hope that they might come back. Imagine how hard it would be to decide if you should keep waiting or just leave the sad experience behind. Sherry and Russell, Ashley's parents, died in the spring of 2020. They never found out what happened to their daughter. Imagine the pain and suffering they went through when they finally realized they would never find out what happened to Ashley. Even more so because she had left the house mad at them. Imagine how hard it was for them to live their lives when everyone from true crime fans to the police to the media thought they were responsible for their daughter going missing. But Ashley's story was finally finished. Even though it's been 18 years, she may not have come home yet because the cops are still looking for her body, but at least her family knows what happened. Think Harold Heyman could kill more people? What do you think of Haman's request for forgiveness? Did he really have a problem with his mind? Or does he enjoy killing people? Tell us what you think in the area for comments. Like, share, and subscribe until the next video. Stay safe.